Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> they went off to war singing George M. Cohan's song, Over There. Something to the effect that over there, over there, send the word to beware that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, and we won't be back till it's over, over there. Those were the World War I doughboys, as they were called in the great World War I. One of those individuals is Frank Buckles. Frank Buckles is an interesting individual. He was born in 1901, February the 1st. And he was born in Kansas, and when he was 16, the great World War I had already started, and he was at the Kansas State Fair. And he saw a recruiting poster, Uncle Sam wants you. So he went to a local Marine recruiter, wanted to join the United States Army to go fight the war to end all wars over there in Europe. The Marines wouldn't take him. You're too small and you are not 18 years of age. And he continued to try to get into the Marine Corps. Finally, he decided he would try the United States Army. He went all the way to Oklahoma City, being only 16, as he said later, I decided to really tell a whopper and tell him I was 21. And the United States Army recruiter said, okay, we'll sign you up. And he joined the United States Army after vigilantly telling people he was 18 when he was only 16, a volunteer to go fight in that war. He signed up for the ambulance service, and the reason he signed up for the ambulance service is he heard that that was the quickest war, a way to get to the battlefield to help other young Americans that were already fighting that war to end all wars. And so he went overseas, he served in France, he drove an ambulance, he rescued not only Americans, but the other allies that had been wounded and took them back behind enemy lines. And after the war was over with in 1918, having joined in 1917, uh, Frank Buckles uh, continued in Europe until he was discharged, uh, protecting, really, and guarding German prisoners of war. And he came back to the United States, and for his service, before he was discharged, he was given $143.60, plus a bonus for serving in combat of $60, came back to America, and of course, there were no benefits in those days, there was no VA, you just went back home and started your own life. In the great World War I, over 400 or 4 million Americans served, 117,000 of them died in Europe. Half of those doughboys died from what they obtained was the Spanish flu. Many of them didn't even know it, got back to, to America, the United States, and died from the Spanish flu that they had uh, contacted while serving overseas. The kind of guy he is, he came back home, started a new life, decided he'd go to sea. He worked on different ships, and in 1940, he found himself in the Philippine Islands. And as we all know, remember in American history, the Philippines were invaded by the Japanese, and there Frank Buckles was, captured by the Japanese. And during World War II, he spent three and a half years in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, having already served in World War I, lied about his age so he could get in as a volunteer. Now in World War II, three and a half years of his life stolen from him by our enemies and he served in that prisoner of war camp. He was finally released when Americans liberated the Philippines, came back to the United States, and lived in West Virginia until the age of 102, Mr. Speaker, 102. He worked the farm. You know, he chose probably the occupation of uh, America's past, the hardworking, individual that works American soil, and that was Frank Buckles, works the soil. Today, Frank Buckles, and here's his photograph, Mr. Speaker, is 109 years old. 
It's an honor for me to call Frank Buckles my friend. This photograph was taken uh, in front of the uh, D.C. Memorial to World War I veterans, which I'll get to in a minute. And so he's 109 years old today. And besides his remarkable life that continues, Frank Buckles is the lone survivor, the lone survivor, the last doughboy alive that served in the United States Army and military during World War I. There are two other survivors. They're both British individuals. They're 109, but he's older than they are. He'll soon be 110 in February. And so he is the last survivor, the last living doughboy that served our country. Now, he'll soon be 110, Mr. Speaker. You know, 110 is old. Uh, to put it in perspective, it's about half of America's history this one person has lived through. Still the great patriot that he was when he raised his right hand as a 16-year-old in 1917 and swore to defend the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, the oath he took to uphold the Constitution. Now, I mention Frank Buckles in his own right because uh, he is the last of this generation. Uh, the, uh, those that uh, lived and, and fought in World War I, you've got to remember who these guys were. These were the fathers of the greatest generation. Those individuals that we hold up, people like my dad, who's 85 years of age, that served in, in the great World War II. Those were the fathers of the greatest generation, people like Frank Buckles. But you see, he still continues to fight for America and really fight for people that served in World War I. Because when I met Frank Buckles, he was here at the Capitol. And his mission now is to make sure that we honor, as a nation, those who served and came back home in World War I, and those that served and are still buried in graves only known by God in Europe, those other doughboys. And his goal, and the goal, I hope, of most Americans now, is to make sure that they are properly honored. You know, America has moved on since World War I. Not much was said after World War I. The, you know, World War I came, uh, the American doughboys came home. They really didn't, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of fanfare. They just merged back into society. All of a sudden came the roaring 20s, you know, the exciting 20s. Then there was the Depression for 10 years, and all of a sudden we're in World War II. You know, America just sort of moved on and left that generation kind of the way they were when they returned. And I say that to say this. Because, you see, in this great capital, the greatest capital in the world, the center of democracy, the center of liberty, the center of really people who have values like Frank Buckles, we have, in my opinion, yet to honor these individuals. Here, not far from the Capitol, down on what we call the Mall, where we have uh, the important memorials to America's past. We have built as a nation for, uh, memorials to three of the great wars of the last century. And if you wander up and down the mall, you will see the first memorial that was built. They were really built in reverse order of when the wars occurred. The first one that was built is that black marble granite memorial to those young men in Vietnam, the 58,000 that went to Vietnam and came home, or, or rather did not come home. You remember Vietnam, Mr. Speaker. That was the, the war when America, we treated our, our troopers real bad. As a nation, we treated them real bad when they came home. But we did build them a memorial, and it's not far from here. And today and every day you go to the Vietnam Memorial, you'll see people have put up flags and, 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 and written notes to those great Americans from Vietnam. And after that was built, then there was the memorial that's built on the mall to the Korean War. You know, we, some of the politically correct folks still call that a conflict. Well, Americans died in the Korean War. 
We went over and fought somebody else's war again. And uh, that memorial shows the um, Americans going uh, through really a minefield in the snow. Great memorial to those Korea, uh, Korean veterans, uh, those that lived and those that died. And then the most recent one, the one that many Americans are aware of because there was so much political fighting whether or not this memorial should be built. And that's the World War II memorial that's built not far from here, that great memorial that honors the greatest generation, that shows uh, how important it is for us to remember those individuals. As I mentioned, people like my dad, who served as an 18-year-old in the United States Army in Europe. And uh, many people didn't want that memorial built on the mall. You know, it's built on the mall. They didn't want it built there. Anyway, politics got out of the way, and Congress approved that memorial. But there is no memorial for those who served in the first great war of the last century. And that's the World War I memorial. It is true there is a memorial near the mall for those that serve from Washington, D.C. Here's a photograph of that memorial. And a picture of Frank Buckles in front of it. This photograph was taken a couple of years ago, or really a year ago, when he was there. And this memorial, it's not even on the maps, that, of the D.C. maps of all the things to do and see in Washington, D.C. This memorial's not even on there. And the only re reason I ever saw it, I was running by it one day, and I saw this memorial, or this monument, this structure, over in the weeds. And went over there and started reading it and realized what it was. And it is a, a not a fitting memorial, but a memorial for the D.C veterans that lived and died in, during the World War I. And you can see it's cracked and the stone is bad and it needs a lot of repairs. And finally repairs are starting to be made for that. Uh, but make no mistake about it, this is a memorial for those from Washington, D.C. But we don't have a memorial on the mall for those that served from all over the United States. An appropriate memorial that I think should be built. The plan is, and Frank Buckle's goal, and mine and many others, is to expand this memorial and honor all those who served in that great war now 100, almost 100 years ago. There are really no advocates for this. I mean, there are no, there are no lobbyists. There are no veterans left from World War I. No other veterans groups have taken this on to encourage us building this memorial for him. Uh, an individual by the name of David Dijon, who is a, a historian, a photographer, started doing research on the last survivors of World War I. And he's got photographs of all of them of recent date, those that have died. Uh, some of them have died and has done research on all of them. And now, there, are, as I mentioned, there are only three from, from all over the world that fought in all, from all nations, Frank Buckles being one of those. Um, and some other individuals are, are encouraging Congress to give authority to build uh, this memorial. Um, Kingwood, Texas, one of the places I represent down in Texas, uh, there is an uh, educator there named, by the name of Jan York. Jan York loves America like you know, educators do, and she got her Creekwood Middle School kids to do, re did re do research on World War I and the last survivors a couple of years ago. And that's when they came up with Frank Buckles, and they too are passionate about making sure that a memorial is built for all that served in World War I on the Mall. And let me mention this, there are, there are memorials for the World War I uh, veterans uh, in different places in the United States. There's one in Kansas City. Uh, but can we have too many? Uh, should we not have one on the, on the Mall? I mean, this is Washington, D.C. You go through Washington, D.C., you'll see memorials and monuments to all kinds of people, wonderful people. Some of them aren't even Americans. They're appropriate. They're needed. But should we not build a memorial on the Mall for all of those that served in World War I, the war that was supposed to end all wars? I think that we should. But anyway, she's helped her school to get involved in this, and the Creekwood Middle School folks are, are encouraging Congress to help build a memorial in other schools in the country. And this memorial is not going to be funded by taxpayer money. Don't get me wrong. This is not something the taxpayers are going to be required to contribute to. 
All Congress has to do is authorize it being built and that there be a commission and then private funds will be collected from groups like Creekwood Middle School. And I want to thank uh, Senator Rockefeller down the hall in the Senate. He is helping to promote legislation that will allow us to uh, move forward and have congressional approval to build this memorial on the mall, this appropriate memorial for people like Frank Buckles, the lone survivor, that it be built on the mall. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I think it is imperative that we as a nation understand our history. Many of us, uh, we don't think about the past, we only think about the future. We think, unfortunately, many times, what can America give us, what can America do for us, as opposed to what can we do for America, what can we do for people that have served in our great country in the military, and what should we do as a nation to honor those individuals. America has uh, always had to defend who we are as, as a nation. And um, I carry in my pocket, like many, maybe most members of Congress, this little book, Constitution of the United States, which has not only the Constitution, but the Declaration of Independence in it as well. And if we just remember a little bit of history, just a little bit, back in colonial days, in 1776, there were these Americans who did not like being treated a certain way by the most powerful empire that had ever existed in the history of the world, the British Empire, most powerful empire at the time. It was led by the most powerful king, King George. But they got together and they said, you know, we are going to liberate ourselves from this type of tyranny, as they looked at it. So they came up with this Declaration of Independence. Now, what that was was really, in legal terms, they indicted the King of England for crimes against the United States. And their remedy, the punishment, for the king and for England was to separate. And they concluded their Declaration of Independence, that important document that later led to the uh, Constitution, with this phrase. And in support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And then they had to fight for what they believed in. Seven, eight years of long war to live, get this country free. And then it was the War of 1812, the Spanish-American War, the war with Mexico, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and we are still engaged in two great wars today. And in all of those wars, Mr. Speaker, it has been America's youth that went to war to protect the rest of us. And unlike other countries, you know, it's been said that America goes to war. That is true. And we got troops fighting right now not to conquer but to liberate. America goes to battle so that others will live in freedom. Our enemies go to battle so that others will die in tyranny. That's what's happening in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it's always been the American warrior that had to protect this document. And there's people like Frank Buckles. And today, occasionally, we get to see those great warriors from the current wars. And they come back uh, to this capital. We see them. Many members go visit the wounded warriors. I've had the honor to be in Iraq and Afghanistan, see our military in action the finest military that's ever existed in the history of the world represents us today. But to some extent, America, at home, we're disengaged. We're, we're more interested, unfortunately, it seems, in what's in it for us as opposed to what's in it for America. Frank Buckles and the generations before him and after have always what's in it for America. What can we do for America, not what America can do for us. So, it's, it seems to me, Mr. Speaker, we owe it to Frank Buckles, we owe it to those doughboys that have all died, have all passed away, except him, that we build and honor them 
for what they did for the rest of us. For without them, we certainly would not be here. Without each generation that has been called upon to bear arms to protect our nation, we would not be here. And many of them died at young ages, including those 600,000 Americans that died in the Civil War when our country went to war within itself. So it would be appropriate that we honor these individuals by approving this mall. And it would be more as, as equally important that we remember Frank Buckles being the lone survivor. I hope he lives a long time. He, said, he told David DeJong not too long ago, I'm headed to 115. Well, he may get it the way he is. He just that way. But he should, when he passes away, we should honor him as the last doughboy. He should lie in state here in the Capitol Rotunda. He should be buried with full military honors. Our nation should remember him. And as important, we should remember those all who served throughout the United States by building that and approving the memorial here on the Mall. You know, when they went overseas, they said they weren't coming back till it was over over there. And they did not come back till it was over over there. And they came back victorious. We over here have the obligation and the opportunity to get it right over here. And the way we get it right is to honor Frank Buckles and honor all of those who served in the great World War I those that served did not come home, and those that served and did come home to continue the American way of life in preserving this little document called the Constitution of the United States of America. And that's just the way it is.